Good morning, everybody. This is Thomas Felder. I am so grateful. I am so grateful to be on with you today on our Transformation Bible Study. And today's subject is the seal of God. The seal of God is today's uh, subject for the Bible study. And I'm just asking that you pray with me this morning as we get going. You know, today's Bible study is going to be probably the most difficult Bible study for some people because this is new information or it's information that's been in the background or information that you've been hearing for years. And, and you've been wondering, is this thing real? This thing? And does it matter to God? Does it matter to the creator of heaven and earth, Elohim? Does it really matter one day versus another? Why can't I just have Sabbath every day? Why can't I just worship him every day? Well, you know, I always try to tell people if, if every day is my birthday, then no day is my birthday. If every day is my anniversary, then no day is my anniversary. If you turn every day into Sabbath, then no day is Sabbath. And days that we honor and celebrate are designed to celebrate something based on somebody who has the right to set the date. I mean, I can't wake up tomorrow and say tomorrow is my birthday if it's not. My mama did that and the doctor and my daddy, they coordinated that and I showed up and I just, I took the date they gave me. I don't know what day I was born, but I take my mama's word and I got a certificate. That's how I know when I was born, the certificate. Does God have a certificate? Do we have a born on date? Does he want to celebrate the born on date? It's so important to us to have ice cream and cake and sing a couple of bars of happy birthday. Can you imagine what kind of joy goes on in heaven when he created us? Let's pray. Holy Spirit, be with us today as we go through this Bible study. Give us wisdom. Let your Holy Spirit move. In these final days of Earth's history, you are breaking every chain, every stronghold, every demonic power, every generational curse. You're breaking them. And Daniel 12, verse 4, it says, in the last days, knowledge will increase. So I pray today, Father that your Holy Spirit will do what I never could, that you will convict, that you will educate, you will change, and you will cause us to be what you want us to be, which is your children. We ask these and so many more blessings in your Holy Son's name. Amen, amen, and amen again. So today, everybody, we talk about the seal of God, the seal of God. Any government puts a seal on its law, every government. Trump right now is trying to reopen the government for some temporary period. He's going to do it by issuing some sort of executive order. And on that executive order, he will put his seal. He will put uh, his name, Donald J. Trump. He will put his title, President of the United States. Well, his title is President. And then his jurisdiction, United States. Are you with me? If he doesn't put that on any law that he sends out, it's not official. It's not official. It's got to have his name, his title, and his jurisdiction. Are you with me? So the God of heaven makes these laws that we talked about yesterday called the 10 suggestions. Nope. Strike that. The 10 opinions. Nope. The 10 puffs of smoke. Nope. He creates the 10 commandments. And these are rules that are to govern over all of his people for all eternity. And he seals the law. He seals it with his name, his title, and his jurisdiction. In the Sabbath commandment, which is the fourth commandment of the 10 that we went over in Exodus chapter 20 yesterday, we find God's name, which is Lord. Well, we know his name is Yahuwah, but it was translated into Lord. We find his name. Secondly, we find his distinguishing title, Lord that made heaven and earth, which makes him the creator. He's your daddy. Some of us don't know who our real daddy is, but we know who our heavenly daddy is. We call him Abba, means daddy. And then what is his territory? 
I mean, is he is he just Lord of America or Lord of China, Lord of Jamaica? Is he just Lord of the Baptists or of the Catholics or of the people who believe in Islam or the people who are Buddhists? Is he Lord of the North Pole, South Pole, and every place in between? He says his territory is heaven and earth. So if you up there or you down here, you in his territory. He made it super duper clear who this is for. Super duper. Now, Sabbath was instituted by God, Yahuwah, and a beneficent creator after six days of creation rested on the seventh day and instituted the Sabbath for all people as a memorial of creation. Well, let me ask you something. Was he tired? Is that what it means when it says he rested? Does God get tired? According to the book of Isaiah, it says he neither slumbers nor sleeps. The fourth commandment of God's unchangeable law requires the observance of the seventh day Sabbath as the day of rest, worship, and ministry in harmony with the teaching and practice of Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath day is a day of rest, day of worship, day of ministry. I've often heard people say that they can worship every day. And you may be able to give praise every day. You may be able to give thanks every day. You may even be able to do some form of worship every day. But you can't rest every day. If you rested every day, you'd be a bum. Also, you would be outside of his command because he tells you to work six days and rest one. So now what we do most days is we work seven days a week or we work six days a week, but we also decide to work on the day that he says rest. Are you with me? We change the day. We change it to some other day and we rest on that day and work on the day that he says rest. The Sabbath is a day of delightful communion with God and one another. It is a symbol of our redemption in Christ. It is a sign of our sanctification, a token of our allegiance, and a foretaste of our eternal future in God's kingdom. When we get to heaven, we'll be keeping Sabbath there. So if you won't keep it here, what makes you think you're going to go up there and keep a different Sabbath? The Sabbath is God's perpetual sign of his eternal covenant between him and his people. Joyful observance of this holy time from even to evening, sunset to sunset, is a celebration of God's creative and redemptive acts. We often sing, I love him, I love him, I love him, I love him. I think Mary Mary has a song that goes like that, where she sings over and over. She loves him. He says, if you love me, man keep my commandments. That's how you show me that you love me. What day of the week did God bless and why? What day of the week did he bless and why? We go to Genesis uh, chapter two, verses one to three. We at the, the infancy of mankind. Man has just been created in Genesis one. Sin has not entered into the equation. Satan has not tempted Adam and Eve at this point. They are not fallen. Genesis 2, 1 to 3. And it says, thus the heavens and the earth were finished, jurisdiction created, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, which day, everybody? On the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it, he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. So in Genesis 2, 1 to 3, we find God's rest, God's rest. So throughout the Bible, when you run across the word Sabbath, Sabbath actually means Abba, that's our daddy, rest. His name is in the word. It's daddy's rest day. Genesis 2, 1 to 3. Now, why did God say remember the Sabbath? Why did he say remember? 
Let's take a look. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thy labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, that's your employees, nor thy cattle, that's your, your instruments of labor, that's your jackhammer, that's your drill, that's your laptop to do your business work, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates, that's people living at your house. For in six days, the Lord made, that's his creator, heaven and earth, that's his jurisdiction, the sea and all them in them is, and rested the seventh day. Why? Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So why did God say, remember the Sabbath day? He wanted it to be a memorial of his creation. Now, I've often heard people say that I have my Sabbath on this day, or my Sabbath is on that day. We don't have a Sabbath. You and I have never created a world. We've never told the sun to come into, the being, into being or told the moon not to move. We can't walk on wind. We can't walk on water. We can't cause mountains to move and the earth to open up wide or command fish to swallow people like Jonah. We can't do it. So we asked, we ask ourselves, well, when is the seventh day? When is it? Can I, can I pick any day out of the seven? Any day. And, and how do you know that the days are the same? Do you know that it is amazing that it's not until you say the Sabbath is the seventh day that people then begin to count the days? As if up until that point, they had no idea of which day was which. When God made the days, he numbered them. He did not name them. He numbered them. And he numbered them so men would not confuse the days. You can change the names as much as you want, but the first day will still be the first day. Second day will still be the second. The third will still be the third. The fourth will still be the fourth. The fifth will still be the fifth. The sixth will be the sixth. And the seventh will be the seventh. And guess what? We can go backward all the way back to the first Sabbath in the garden. On today's calendar that we keep in America, what is the first day of the week? What do we call it, everybody? We call the first day what? Can't hear you? Sunday, that is correct. We call the second day what? Monday. Third day, Tuesday. Fourth day, Wednesday. Fifth day, Thursday. Sixth day, Friday. And we call the seventh day, Saturday. Now, those are man's names. And each one of those names were designed to represent a particular God or entity that the people worshiped. The first day was set aside to worship the sun. Now we're not gonna get into that today. We'll save that for later on, maybe tomorrow or the day after. But I want you to know that the day represented who you worshiped. Second day, they worshiped the moon. Third day, they worshiped the God of war, right? Thursday, they worshiped a different God, et cetera. But he says, my day is the seventh. That's mine. I own this one. These other six days, you should be working. This day, you should be worshiping me, meaning you lay everything else down, and it's my time. That's very different than you having morning devotional and jump in your car and go to work for Mr. Smith. His time. Sabbath is a sign of sanctification by God. You want to be sanctified? According to Exodus 31, verses 12 to 17, Exodus 31, verses 12 to 17. Listen, if you're hearing these verses for the first time, write them down. And it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generation that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Ye shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. So this was a big deal, the Sabbath thing. 
For whosoever doeth any work, the soul shall not be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual, that means non-ending, a perpetual, that means eternal, a perpetual, that means an infinite end date, meaning never. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. That's Exodus 31, verses 12 to 17. Sabbath is a sign between God and his people. It is a sign that sets the obedient apart from the disobedient. The Bible says, speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, verily, my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Now, why does Moses have to keep telling these people, keep the Sabbath, it's a sign, keep the Sabbath, it's a sign? Because there were other gods that people worshipped. And those other gods were idol gods. They were actually fallen demons, fallen angels who were demons. And they commanded worship too. They commanded uh, sacrifices. They commanded holy days. And Israel, every time it apostatized, remember I told you keeping Sabbath and keeping the commandments are like marriage. Every time they adulterized, fornicated, they went after another god. Israel was always drawn to sun worship like the pagans. In Ezekiel 20, verses 12 to 20, sorry, 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 Ezekiel 20, verses 12 and 20, it says, moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them and hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. So he's telling them over and over, this is the book of Ezekiel now. This is not Exodus. He's telling them again. In Jeremiah chapter five, verses 30 and 31, he talks about Israel's unfaithfulness. He says the priests, pastors, and prophets prophesied by Baal worship and led Israel astray. We find that in Jeremiah 2.8. They were being led to sun worship versus Sabbath worship. The worship of the sun had to do with where the people were facing. Sun worship was practiced by the Canaanites, but lately had been introduced from Assyria. And between the porch and the altar was the place where priests offered prayer. So that's where they were supposed to pray. There was a designated place of prayer between the, um, the porch and the altar. And these priests with their faces, of course, were supposed to turn towards the temple with their backs to the sun. But in this spot with their backs to the temple, the adoration of the sun took place as a complete renunciation or turning your back on, on, on Yahuwah was being designated. So when they turned their back on, on the temple to face the sun, it was the same as turning their back on God. In 2 Chronicles 29.6, it says, for our fathers have trespassed and done that which was evil, evil in the eyes of the Lord our God, and have forsaken him and turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord and turned their backs. So in 2 Chronicles 29, 6, he's talking about people turning their backs on God. And it was a literal back turning, turned his back to the temple and turned their face to the sun. You can find verses on this on Ezekiel 8, 16, 2 Kings 23, 5 and 11, Jeremiah 8.2 and Joel 2.27. I just want to zero in on Ezekiel 8 verses 15 and 16. Ezekiel 8 verses 15 and 16. And he says, then said he unto me, this is God speaking to Ezekiel. 
Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. So what he had just shown them in Ezekiel 8 was people eating these little wafers, these little worship cakes, these sun cakes, to, to Tammuz, right? We call them hot cross buns. And the people were also putting ashes on their foreheads. You, they do that on Ash, Sun, Ash Wednesday, and they put the little, the little cross on their heads. And they would weep for Tammuz. It was 40 days that they would weep for a pagan idol god named Tammuz, and it would, they called it Lent. It's still called Lent, and it is still practiced. So in Ezekiel 8.16, it says, And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, which is twenty-five men, with their backs towards the temple of the Lord, and their faces towards the east, and they worshiped the sun towards the east. They were at the Father's church, but doing sun worship. Let me ask you a question. Is it still possible today that we could be in the Father's church still doing sun worship? Because of this disobedience with the sun worship that they kept going back to, Israel was put into captivity. In Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 3, 8, and 5, Israel was called rebellious seven times. In Ezekiel 5.11, it says, Wherefore, as I live, saith the Lord, surely because thou hast defiled my sanctuary with all thy detestable things and with all thine abominations, therefore will I diminish thee, neither shall mine eye spare, neither will I have pity. Because they would not keep his Sabbaths, they, he put them into slavery because they wouldn't keep his Sabbaths. Did Jesus keep the seventh day Sabbath? According to Luke 4.16, it says, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. He went into church, what you call church, and he stood up and he read from the scriptures. That's what they did. And that's what we're supposed to do, even today, to go to church and read from the scriptures. That's the purpose of it. So we can learn the word. And if it was his habit, whose habit should it be? Should it be mine? Should it be yours? In Mark chapter 1, verses 21, it says, Then they went into Capernaum. And immediately on the Sabbath day, he entered the synagogue and taught. That was his habit. It was his custom. So it wasn't a one-off thing. The Bible writers are trying to let you know this is where you can find them every Sabbath. Now, here are four simple proofs of the biblical Sabbath. There's a lot of verses that we'll go through today. We don't have a lot of time, but let me give you some some um, proof texts that you can keep. These are simple and they're easy. The first proof text is God created it and kept it himself. We find that in Genesis chapter two, verses two and three. We've already read that for you this morning. The second proof text is God commanded it. We find that in Exodus 20, verses eight through 11, right? So it's in the official commandments that he wrote with his finger. The third proof texts are a group of texts showing that Jesus Christ kept the Sabbath. You know, the Pharisees accused them of a lot of things, but they never accused them of not keeping the Sabbath. Are you with me? They never said, you know, you're not doing the Sabbath. They accused them of doing the wrong thing on the Sabbath. Are you with me? So we find Jesus Christ kept it, and we find Mark 1.21. Mark 6, 2, Luke 4, 16, Luke 4, 31, Luke 13, 10, Luke 14, verses 1 to 5, John 7, 23. What you will find consistently is most of his miracles he did on the Sabbath. He wanted to show them that the Sabbath was supposed to be a time of healing and regeneration. 
Proof text number four, the apostles and the early church kept it. So sometimes people say, well, you know, I'm a New Testament Christian and, you know, I'm going to, I'm, I'm not going to keep it because the, the apostles kept a different day. Well, not according to the Bible. Acts 13, verse four, uh, sorry, Acts 13, 14, Acts 13, 14, Acts 13, 42 to 44, Acts 16, 13, Acts 17, 2, which says it was part. Paul's custom, Paul kept the same custom that Jesus kept and Acts 18.4, right? You can take a picture of it if you're on the internet. I left it up for a minute. Acts 13.14, Acts 13 verses 42 to 44, Acts 16.13, Acts 17.2, Acts 18.4. So don't ever let someone tell you that the early church apostles were keeping a different day. Not so. Sabbath as a sign that they will know that the Lord sanctifies them. These children of Israel were looking for redemption for anybody and they were willing to chase down any false God. And repeatedly, Elohim who created heaven and earth had to remind them, I got you out of trouble, you're mine. So it says in Ezekiel 20 verses 12 to 20, it says, moreover also I've given them my Sabbath to be a sign that they walk he said, they rebelled against me and they walked not after my statutes. And he says, yet also I lifted my hand unto them in the wilderness that I would not bring them into the land which I had given them flowing with milk and honey because they did not follow the Sabbaths. He let them, he punished them in the wilderness because they despised my judgments and walked not in my statutes, but polluted my Sabbaths for their hearts went after idols. And he says, and they hollow my Sabbaths. He tells them, walk in my statutes and hollow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you that ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. So he tells them when they, here's a sign of I sanctify you because you didn't honor it. I destroyed you in the wilderness. And if you want to be my people, come back and keep the day that tells the world who you are following. Jesus kept the Sabbath. We see that in John 15, 10. It says, if you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. So uh, we want to abide in him. The Sabbath is a promise of God's rest, God's Sabbath rest. According to Hebrews chapter four, verses one through six, Hebrews chapter four, verses one to six, it says, let us therefore fear lest a promise being left of us entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith that heard it. So he says, don't just keep the commandments. You got to have the faith of Jesus. Remember the, the, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, they go together. For we have believed for we which have believed do enter the rest, as he said. I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, what rest, everybody? My Sabbath rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he spoke in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and he said, God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter, meaning that some people are still not keeping this Sabbath rest. And they to whom it was first preached enter not because of unbelief. So the children of Israel, when they in the wilderness, they didn't want to keep the Sabbath either. The Sabbath is a covenant in the word of God. There were covenants at creation. What were the covenants given at creation? The first of the covenants included ordinances along with the covenant. The first one was the Sabbath, then marriage, and then labor. These were three things that God gave the children of Israel. Well, strike that. He gave humankind prior to sin. That was the first covenant, the Sabbath, a memorial of creation. Marriage, 
which is a sign of togetherness, oneness, right? The same way we were supposed to be one in him is the way Adam and Eve were supposed to be one. And then he gave us labor. We were not supposed to be lazy. We were supposed to work. We can't have Sabbath without work. They go hand in hand. That's why the fourth commandment says that we're supposed to work six days and rest one. So that's why he gave them labor even prior to sin. Adam and Eve were supposed to work even before sin. He also gives them covenants of redemption. Covenants of redemption. He gave Adam a covenant saying in Genesis 3.15 that I'm going to come back and I'm going to send a savior. Genesis 3.15. He gave Noah a covenant of preservation. That was, that's what the rainbow was about. He gave Abraham a promise that I'm going to send somebody, Abraham, that is going to be a seed that's going to save the whole world. He gives Moses a covenant, which is his law. So the people knew what to do and how to live. He gives David a covenant, which is, I'm going to give you an eternal kingdom. And then he gives them Christ as the final piece of the covenant that says that none of you were able to keep my law. So my son is the only one that can sign off this on this law to save all of you. Because the first Adam broke it. When we rest on his Sabbath, we, we are indicating that we trust him. Because Hebrews 4, verses 3 and 4 says, for we who have believed enter that rest. Just as he has said, he says, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. When he talks about the foundation of the world, he's talking about Genesis 2, 2. And God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. God predetermined plan to bring us into salvation. So at the very beginning, we were supposed to rest in him. We call that now grace. Because we can't save ourselves, just like we didn't make ourselves. Grace. Hebrews 4 verse 10 says, for one who has entered his rest has him himself also rested from his works as God did from his. So when we rest on the seventh day, we're imitating God. I'm walking like my daddy. I want to talk like my daddy. I want to live like my daddy. Ephesians 1, 4 says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. Those who walk by faith will receive his plan of salvation. Revelation 13, verse 8 says, the lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. So even then he had a plan for our redemption. And even then it was indicated by his Sabbath. Some people say, I got a different Sabbath. I got, I, Jesus is my Sabbath. You ever heard that? Jesus is my Sabbath? Or Jesus, I, I keep a different day because Jesus rose from the dead. When we go to Hebrews 4, verses 7 through 11, and it says, again, he limited a certain day, saying in David, today, after so long a time, as it is written, today you shall hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then not he, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. He's saying Jesus didn't give them a new Sabbath. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Same rest from the beginning. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us not labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. He says, don't fight the Sabbath. Just have the same rest that God had. He says, Jesus did not give you a different rest. The Sabbath rest is a rest of God himself. Its full fruition is in the future, though followers are now part of it. We can never really experience God's rest even now. We're going to have to wait till we get to the, to the new heavens and the new earth. Because even here on the Sabbath day, it's a lot of stressful things we've got to deal with. It's not complete rest. The Israelites did not receive the promise of God's rest because of disobedience. The next generation under Joshua also thought they had made it, but not so. Because God later said in Psalms, they shall never enter my rest in Psalms 95.11. Even after Joshua's time, the people didn't learn their lesson. They still wouldn't keep his Sabbath rest. The Sabbath is rooted in God's ability to create us and redeem us. 
In Exodus chapter 20, he says, keep the Sabbath because I created you. But in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 12 to 15, he says, keep it because I redeemed you. It says, keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it as the Lord thy God has commanded thee. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Why? He jumps down, he says, and remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence with a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore, the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. So he tells them in Exodus 20, you keep this day because I, I created you. And now he's telling them also I redeemed you. And that, that is what he does for each one of us. He creates us new. We are born again in him and he has redeemed us from our sin. He says, I will give them an everlasting name if they don't pollute, pollute the Sabbath covenant. He says, I will give you an everlasting name. In Isaiah 56, verses 5 and 6, it says, even unto them will I give in mine house and with my walls a place and a name better than, than of the sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant. So he was talking about people who were eunuchs and eunuchs were not supposed to be saved or go to heaven or be redeemed. But he says, even the eunuchs and the strangers, according to Isaiah 56, if they keep the Sabbath, I will give them a name and I will treat them like my son. The purpose of the Sabbath was to show us in Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11, he is our creator. It talks about relationship. In Deuteronomy 5 that we just read, uh, it talks about him being our redeemer. Again, it talks about our relationship to him. Sabbath is about relationship, not rituals. The Pharisees didn't understand that. The Pharisees were going through the motions, but had no relationship. The Bible commands us to speak of the Sabbath, Sabbath day as a delight. And he gives us a promise. It's a promise. If you do this, then I'll do that. It says, if thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable, that's what he wants you to call it. Call it a delight. Call it honorable. And thou shalt honor him. You're going to honor him by doing that not doing thy own ways, nor finding thy own pleasure, nor speaking thy own words. That means I'm not talking about the game on the Sabbath. I can't take your text messages about my business on the Sabbath. I can't speak my own words. I got to find the light in him. And he says, if you do that, he says, then it's a conditional phrase. If you do this, then I'll do that. It's a promise. Then shall thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father. It is a promise. He is a promise keeper. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. This is Isaiah 58 verses 13 and 14. Here's a different version. It says, keep the Sabbath day holy. Don't pursue your own interests on that day, but enjoy the Sabbath and speak of it with delight as the Lord's holy day. Honor the Sabbath and everything you do on that day and don't follow your own desires or talk idly then the Lord will be your delight. Psalms 37 verse four says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires and the secret petitions of your heart. Delight yourself, that means trust in him. When does Sabbath begin? Sabbath begins on Friday evening, evening, right? On Leviticus 23, 32, it says, it shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest and ye shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even, from even until even shall you celebrate the Sabbath. So in Leviticus 23, 32, he's telling them when, when a Sabbath is beginning, it goes from even to evening. Why does it start in the evening? Because when we go to Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 to 5, and it tells us during creation, God said, it says, then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning was, was the first day. 
We find that in Genesis 1. So the day started with what part? The dark part or the light part? It started with the, the dark part, right? Because it says that the world was dark until he said, let there be light, right? So he called the darkness that was at the beginning before he called the light the beginning of the day. So anytime like tonight, today is Sunday. So tonight when it gets dark, it, Monday has already begun in God's, in God's calendar. The second day has already begun. Sabbath starts at sunset Friday. Sabbath day is Saturday, according to the calendar we keep now. Sabbath ends on Sunday night. Sabbath is a time of worship and prayer. Just remember that the Bible indicates that evening is at the going down of the sun. Was Sabbath made just for the Jews? According to Mark 2.27, and he said unto them, the Sabbath was made from man, and that means mankind, and not, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also, Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Some say Sabbath was made for the Jews only and not for the Gentiles. But Jesus says it was made for all mankind or people everywhere from the very beginning of time. So when you go to Acts chapter 13, Acts chapter 13, starting at verse 42, you'll see that Paul is converting the Gentiles. And he still has them coming to the synagogue on the Sabbath. He doesn't tell the Gentiles, hey, meet me here on Sunday. Meet me here on the first day. He doesn't do that. Acts chapter 13, just check it out. Okay, he has them meet them back on the Sabbath. He doesn't say, come meet me on the new Sabbath or the Gentile Sabbath. God's law is eternal. It's eternal. The Sabbath is forever. According to Psalms 111 verses 7 and 8. It says the works of his hands are verity and judgment. That means truth and judgment. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. So if the law of God is forever, that means Sabbath is forever. According to Leviticus 16.31, that means his covenant is forever. According to 1 Chronicles 16.15, according to Psalms 119.60, his law is forever. And according to Isaiah 40, verse 8, his word is forever. Somebody tell me when forever became temporary. When forever became temporary. Now, where are the commandments kept? Where are the commandments kept? It says in Revelation eleven nineteen, 19, it says, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the Ark of the Testament. What was in the Ark of the Testament? The Ark was where where the Ten Commandments were stored. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and the earthquake and great hail. So in heaven, God has a set of Ten Commandments. Remember I told you that this is the, the covenant between a king, a sovereign and his subjects, and he signed a treaty with them. He gave a copy of the treaty to the, to the subjects and he kept a copy for himself. So they mirrored. So nobody could say it was altered. Inside the ark were the Ten Commandments of tables of stone. We find that in Deuteronomy 10, verses 4 and 5. So Moses had his, an ark that was made similar to the one in heaven. The law must be kept, but God promises mercy for his people who break it. Because above the ark was something called the mercy seat. We call that grace. Mercy seat. When you fall short, he says, I got you. Exodus 31, 18. And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communion with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, the tables of stone written with the finger of God. So God wrote these agreements with his own finger, gave a set to Moses, kept a set for himself. The commandments on earth are just a copy of those in heaven. When we go to Revelation 15, 5, and it says, and after that, I looked and beheld or looked and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. When we go to Hebrews 9.23, it says, It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves were better sacrifices than these. So they were earthly priests, but Christ says, I'm your heavenly priest. He gave them earthly commandments, and he says, I've got a copy up in, up in heaven, right? Exodus 32, verses 15 and 16. 
It says Moses turned and went down from the mountain with two tables of testimony in his hand, tables which were written on both sides. He wrote them on both sides so people could not tamper with them. They were complete. The tablets were God's work and the writing was God's writing engraved on the tablets. In Hebrews 8, verse 5, Hebrews 8, verse 5, it says, see that thou make all things according to the pattern. God was telling Moses when he was building the tabernacle, make it according to the pattern of the one in heaven. Do you remember Jesus when he prayed? He says, thou will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Heaven is what we are copying. We are copies of what is being done in heaven. Which day will the saints keep in the new earth? So when we get to heaven, what day will we keep holy? Right? Every day, even in heaven, you say, man, in heaven, every day is holy. Well, the Bible says even in heaven, we're going to keep the Sabbath. It's still going to be a special day among special days in heaven. According to Isaiah 66, verses 22 and 23, it says, for as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, that means from one month to another, because that's how they counted months based on the cycles of the moon, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me. So we're still going to show up. Even though I'm going to have wings and can fly across the universe, I'm going to show up on Sabbath to give worship saith the Lord, and they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. People who said, man, I'm not following your laws. I'm going to do my own laws. It says, for their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be abhorring unto all flesh. Now, there were two sets of laws that sometimes are confused by people, especially if you don't read the Old Testament. They confuse the, the covenants of Moses called the ceremonial laws with the law of God, the, one, the 10 commandments that he wrote with his own finger. Here's a summary of the distinctions between the law of God and the law of Moses. The law of God was written by God on tablets of stone. It was put inside the Ark of the Covenant. It is a moral law. It was exalted by Christ, was not abolished. It is spiritual. It was here before sin. It is the law of liberty. It is not burdensome and it is perfect. Compared to the law of Moses, which was the ceremonial law, which is ceremonies about how to slay lambs and bread that had to be eaten and wine that needed to be drunk on certain Sabbath days, right? There were seven ceremonial Sabbath days, separate and apart from the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath. So the law of Moses were written by Moses in a book. It was put beside the ark and not in the ark. It was a ceremonial law. It was abolished by Christ at the cross. It is fleshly, not spiritual, has been added because of sin, is a condone, condemning law, which is, is a heavy yoke, heavy yoke killing these lambs every day. You wouldn't want to do that. It was imperfect, right? It was only supposed to be a stand-in until Christ came. The two laws compared. We find in Deuteronomy 4.12 that the Ten Commandment law was spoken by God. We find in Leviticus 1, verses 1 to 3, that the ceremonial law was spoken by Moses. Spoken by Moses, right? So go ahead and check the verses out. The two laws compared, written, one was written by God and the other was written by Moses. In Exodus 31, 18, it says the two tablets of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. We find that the ceremonial law according to Deuteronomy 31, 9. And Moses wrote this law and delivered it unto the priests, the sons of Levi. Deuteronomy 10, 4 says, and he, God, wrote the tables according to the commandments, first writing the 10 commandments, which spake unto the, uh, which he spake unto the, the mount out of the midst of the fire. So very different. Moses wrote the ceremonial law. God wrote the, the 10 commandment law with his own finger. It doesn't mean that Moses didn't get instruction and direction to write the ceremonial law. But it simply meant God wanted to leave some clear distinction. So 4,000 years later, you and I won't be arguing that Moses wrote the Ten Commandments. He wanted to make sure there was a clear distinction between the two. 
the two laws were were written differently. One was written in stone and the other one was written on paper. According to Exodus 31, 18, it says that the 10 commandments were written on tables of stone. And according to Deuteronomy 31, 24, and it says, and it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of the law in a book. So Moses wrote his down in a book, not a book made out of stone. Moses wrote his in the book and God wrote his in stone. There was also the Ark of the Covenant. The Ten Commandments were kept inside the Ark. According to Deuteronomy 10, verses 1 through 5 in Exodus 31, 4, it says, I will write on these tables the words that were on the first tables, which thou breakest, and thou shalt put them in the Ark. Right? And he says, and I turned myself and came down from the mount, and I put the tables in the Ark, which the Lord had commanded me. So inside of God's covenant to make sure it's protected, just like he put Noah inside of an ark to protect Noah and the, the animals, he put his commandments in the ark so they would be protected. Was the ceremonial law placed inside the ark? According to Deuteronomy 31, 26, it says, take the book of instruction and place it beside the ark of the covenant of the Lord, your God, so that it may remain there as a witness against the people of Israel. So God's 10 commandment law was inside the ark. Moses's book of instruction was beside the ark. He was again leaving a clear distinction between the two. The two laws compared again. The 10 commandments are supposed to be obeyed for all time according to Matthew 5:19. It says whosoever shall break one of the least of these commandments and teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. What about the ceremonial law? Are we supposed to keep that forever? According to Acts 15.24, Acts 15.24, it says, uh, for as much as ye have heard that certain went, went out from you, they have troubled you. This is um, Luke. And in his writings, he's talking about that these um, the Gentiles that are becoming Christians are being troubled by some rules that the Jews have for them. And he says, saying, ye must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. So Paul was saying, we didn't give the Gentiles a commandment to keep circumcision. Circumcision was given to Abraham. And the reason God had him cut the foreskin off of his penis was because the people were sexual deviants. And so he says, every time you look down at yourself, uh, Abraham, and your, your descendants look down at yourself or, or you know, see your penis, you're going to know that you're different than the other people. I told them, I don't want them doing sodomy. I don't want men with men. I don't want women with women. I want you to know that you are different. So he says, when, when, they, when the uh, Gentiles came in, they, they were uncircumcised. And this was just a difficult thing for them to absorb. So Paul said to them, listen, stick with the Ten Commandments. Stick with the Ten Commandments. Circumcise your heart. Because that's really what he was trying to tell Moses and them to do. Circumcise their heart. The two laws compared again. Did Christ uphold the Ten Commandments? Isaiah 42, 21, it says, The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake, and he will magnify the law and make it honorable. Christ, did Christ uphold the ceremonial law? According to Ephesians 2, 15, it says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of the commandments contained in the ordinances. You won't find anywhere that the Ten Commandments are called ordinances, right? The Ten Commandments are like the Constitution. The ordinances, of which are the ceremonial law, are like local city laws, local city instructions, right? Ten Commandments are like the Constitution, not changing. The two laws compared. The Ten Commandments are our standard. According to James chapter 2, verses 8 to 12, James calls it the royal law. Remember I told you that it was a law between a, a king and his subjects? For whosoever should keep the whole law, that's the whole Ten Commandments, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So if you keep nine and get rid of the fourth, you're guilty of all. For he that saith, do not commit adultery, saith also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. He was saying these 10 come as a set. Colossians 2, verses 16 and 17. 
It says, therefore, let, let no one judge you in meat or drink or in respect of a holy day or of a new moon or of the Sabbath days. So we know, based on Leviticus 23, there were other holy days other than the Sabbath. But the seventh day Sabbath had nothing to do with meat or drink. There were no ordinances in the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20 that talked about how they were supposed to eat or drink. But all of the other Sabbath days had rules and instructions. The ceremonial Sabbath days that pointed to Jesus' coming had instructions about what they could eat, when they could eat, how they could eat, etc. And the offerings that they were supposed to bring for those different Sabbath days. When did they begin? The Ten Commandment Law begin at creation. Exodus 20 verses 8 to 11 tells us that it is a commemoration of his creation. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all the men them is, and he rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So we know based on Exodus 20 verses 8 to 11 and Genesis 2 verses 1 to 3, that Sabbath and the Ten Commandments came at creation. What about the ceremonial law? The ceremonial law, according to Leviticus 23, 24, it says, speak unto the children of Israel, saying in the seventh month, in the first day of the month, ye shall, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of the blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. The feast of trumpets was the marking of a new civil year. So they got these commandments, these ceremonial laws from Moses after they left out of Egypt. After they left out of Egypt is when they got the ceremonial law but they had these 10 commandment laws from the beginning of time. The 10 commandment Sabbath began before sin. We find that again in Genesis 2, 1 to 3, and we find that uh, the ceremonial law based on Leviticus 23 and 24 began after they came out of Egypt. The Sabbath will be kept in heaven. It says in Isaiah 66, 23, from one Sabbath to another, that habits will glorify the new earth. Just like in Matthew 5, 18, it says, if heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not. So even if, when heaven and earth is gone, when this heaven and this earth is gone, and we have a new one, according to Isaiah 66, uh, 23, guess what? Sabbath will still be there. Sabbath will still be there. Luke 16, 17 says, it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than for one tittle of the law to fail. One tittle of the law to fail. So the Sabbath was only meant for the Jews? Then why did Jesus say it was for all mankind? When you look at the verse in Mark 2.27, he uses the word anthropos, meaning all mankind. Like the people study anthropology, which is the study of man, mankind. So it's, it include all humans, male or female, mankind. You will never find the Seventh-day Sabbath listed as the Sabbath of the Jews anywhere in the Bible. It's not there. You won't find it. Not, no verse, nowhere. Okay? People who want to, to walk away from the Sabbath or turn their back on the Sabbath will tell you that is the Sabbath of the Jews. But nowhere in the Bible does it say it's the Sabbath of the Jews. It's the Sabbath of mankind. What did Jesus and Paul keep? According to Luke 4.16 and Acts 17.2 and Acts 18.4, they both kept the Sabbath day. So we can't say Paul gave us a different religion or Paul gave us a different worship day. Can't, can't put that on Paul. How should it affect me to learn that Jesus kept the Sabbath day? According to 1 Peter 2.21, if I know that Jesus kept the Sabbath, what should I do? According to 1 Peter 2.21, we should follow his example. Since Jesus set an example for me in Sabbath keeping, surely I will want to follow him in keeping it. So here's the, here's the, uh, the million dollar question. If Jesus didn't change the Sabbath and God didn't change the Sabbath, then how did it get changed? How did it get changed? Listen, we're out of time today. I can't even get into it. But listen, the Bible does tell you how it got changed. And the Bible told you when it would be changed. And the Bible told you who changed it. It's there. We're going to get into that tomorrow. Right. But in the book of Daniel, it surely does say that it would be changed and it did happen. So, listen, I'm going to open up the line. Hopefully somebody got a blessing from today. You got some verses that will help bring some clarity. And I just pray that the Holy Spirit was able to do what I could not.
The Holy Spirit is there to convict us, to teach us, to instruct us in all righteousness. And he gives us this word as a roadmap. So hopefully today I've given you some markers on the roadmap so the Holy Spirit can continue the work that he's already doing in each of us. I'm gonna open up the lines. If there are any questions or comments, please feel free. Please feel free to um, voice them. Also, um, I'm gonna go on the line uh, on Facebook. So if you're on Facebook and you have a comment or question, you can also put that in the feed and we'll try to respond to that. But tomorrow we're gonna to talk about who changed God's sign, right? We just went through verses saying that the Sabbath is his sign. So who changed it? Who changed it? And what did they change it to? And when did they change it, right? Did God authorize the change? Did he co-sign it? We're going to talk about all of that tomorrow. And the next day, we're going to talk about 80 facts about Sabbath and Sunday. The day after that, we'll talk about heaven and hell. And the day after that, we'll talk about New Jerusalem. And then on the 30th or the 31st day, we'll give you a recap. And we'll be done with our 30 days of transformation. I don't see any persons in the queue um, on the phone lines. We'll check Facebook and see if there are any comments or questions uh, on Facebook. Let's take a look. Let's take a look if anybody has any comments or questions there. I don't see any comments or questions. That means everybody's good. Listen, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Uh, don't don't uh, meet me here. Beat me here. Be here for 6 a.m. tomorrow, and we're going to talk about who changed the Sabbath, and was it authorized? That's what we're going to talk about tomorrow, okay? I'm going to check the phone lines one last time. Nobody's in the queue. With that being said, let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for this time today. We thank you for your blessings and your mercy and your care. And when we did not know what to do, Father, you gave us grace and you gave us mercy. And your, your word says you winked at it. You winked at it. But your word says now that we know you're calling all men to repentance. So I pray that your Holy Spirit will continue to work on us as we read and study your word. We pray for our finances. We pray for our health. We pray for our marriages. We pray for our children. We pray for our nation. We pray for our pastors. We pray for our churches. But most importantly, we pray for salvation. Because what would it profit us, Father, to gain the whole world and to lose our own soul? Amen, amen, and amen again. Well, listen, everybody, until next time, this is Thomas Felder. I look forward to seeing each of us at the gates of the kingdom. Um, be faithful. Be faithful. You guys take care. Today's call is officially over. Thank you so much for joining us online today. We'll be back tomorrow. And we're going to be talking about how God's Sabbath got changed and who changed it. Take care, everybody.